we started these lectures with an egg and a sperm, gametes, uniting, completing each other to produce epithelial cells. Of course, they first unite to produce the zygote, which undergoes many rounds of mitosis to produce not one, but many epithelial cells, like so. Don't worry, I'm not gonna draw every single cell produced by the 10 or dozen rounds of cell division that unites the zygote with the blastula. The blastula is a hollow ball of epithelial cells. In the case of a sea urchin, most of these cells are, they're a single cilium the exceptions are the ones that are still occasionally dividing. They do continue division after that. This epithelial layer is underlain by a basal lamina and encloses a fluid cavity, sustains that fluid cavity through the actions of pumps that transport ions across the epithelium this fluid cavity is called the blastocele. Seal is cavity. This is the blastula stage. These cells have their apical ends bearing the cilium facing out to the outside world, the seawater in the case of a sea urchin. The blastula is the definitive stage for animal de development. Every animal has a blastula in some sense of the word. Um, it might look different. So for example, in uh, some Nemertians I know, it happens to look uh, rather flat. And um, the ciliation might vary in structure and density across the blastula. Nevertheless, this is an epithelium enclosing a fluid cavity. The fluid cavity might be full. Many insects, the blastula consists of an epithelial layer. No cilia, because arthropods lost them. It's part of the deal with getting, getting armored. Instead of a fluid cavity, they might enclose a yolk cell. So that would be a typical insect like uh, fruit flies or cricket, whatever. The blastula need not consist of a great many cells. For example, uh, in barnacles, there are a couple of large yolk cells overlain by uh, several dozen relatively small cells at what passes for the blastula stage. So this definition of the blastula is a fairly loose one, but the basic idea is that all of the, uh, all of the sausage making that constitutes animal development starts with this monolayered epithelial sheet where the inside is differentiated from the outside. If you were to divide the life cycle up into chunks based on how many cell divisions it takes to get from one to the other, well, for a big animal like us, consisting of, you know, I don't know, maybe what, 10 to the 12th cells, something like that. Uh, that means that an average cell that you pick out of your body has undergone 30 odd cell divisions maybe 50 for something like your intestinal wall, maybe 20 for cells in, 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 the, in the oocyte lineage or something like that. But at any rate, 30 odd cell divisions since the zygote. And approximately a dozen of those might have taken place between the zygote and the blastula. So roughly a third of the cell divisions in the history of any cell in the body 
might have taken place during this phase. And for something like a starfish or a sea urchin, it's a tiny fragment of the, of the absolute time in the life cycle. It might take 12 hours to get to a blastula hatch and swim off into the plankton, executing those 12 divisions in that time. The numbers, the exact numbers might be different for different animals, but they're not that different. So why is this so? Why are they in such a great hurry? Part of the answer is that the egg is such a huge cell. It's such a huge cell that the zygote genome, until it's amplified many, many times, which is one of the things that cell division does, it makes more copies of DNA, right? The diploid zygote genome has no hope of filling up this huge cell with new gene products in any kind of reasonable time. It can't change the program, in other words, until it makes many, many more copies of the genome. And I want to illustrate that very explicitly by talking for the only time I think I will in this entire course about gene expression. Let's make a cartoon gene here. Always a big blocky arrow on a piece of DNA, right? What do we do with genes? We express them because uh, RNA polymerase recognizes something at the front end. Here's an RNA polymerase sitting down. It's got a you know a couple of accessory parts, surely, uh, sitting down at the beginning of a gene. And RNA polymerase, having recognized this site, travels along the DNA, extruding, as it were, a little tail of RNA. It makes RNA from this gene. So let's line up these little mice here. As they progress along the template, the tail gets longer and longer until a complete transcript has emerged with an end like that. And the mouse can go off and find another gene that needs to be transcribed. Okay, so this is a complete mRNA. What happens to mRNA? Of course, it gets exported from the nucleus where you carry oats, right? And it encounters sooner or later a ribosome. And if RNA polymerase was a mouse, I'm going to make the ribosome look like a sea urchin, just because it makes making all these drawings a little bit more fun. Okay, so that's a ribosome that recognizes an mRNA and begins to translate the genetic code in the ribosome into a protein product. So uh, ribosomes recruit. Let's just draw a separate mRNA that's got a whole bunch of little urchins like a hapless kelp getting gobbled up. Three ought to be enough. They are producing progressively their own little tails which then fold up somehow as they're translated into a completed protein. Which may or may not even really be finished. It might undergo some processing or maybe it's in the middle of the secretory pathway or something like that, who knows? The point is, if you want to change the program in a cell, typically you have to express new genes and doing so means RNA polymerase has to recruit to the promoter of a physical entity in the chromosome, 
of which you might have two copies in a diploid cell, and those might be the only two copies you've got for typical genes. They've got a trundle along producing a complete mRNA, which takes time. How much time? We'll specify in a second. That mRNA has to get exported, translated, protein has to fold up. There are delays intrinsic to every step here. They're just delays, though. What really matters is how often RNA polymerase can complete a transcript and how often the ribosome can complete translating a protein from that transcript. And it happens that the footprint here for one little mouse is about 50 nucleotides. And it also happens that the footprint for a ribosome is something like 50 nucleotides. You can only line up one mouse at a time. They can go in single file along a piece of DNA, right? So that 50 nucleotide footprint means uh, no other RNA polymerase can read that segment at a time. It takes about 50 nucleotides it takes about a second for RNA polymerase, if it's working at high efficiency, to cross that 50 nucleotide footprint. Now, depending on um, how scarce amino acids are, things like that, ribosomes um, might vary in their rate, but it's roughly in the same ballpark. So we end up with convenient numbers, really convenient numbers. You can produce off the end of a single copy of a gene, one complete transcript per second. That's the rate at which the mice are gonna come off the end or the urchins are gonna come off the end of the ribosome too. So from each mRNA, you can make one complete protein per second, roughly. So with two copies of the DNA, it turns out if you work it out, if you don't have any turnover, that is, if these products, the RNA is stable and you can use it over and over and over again, and the protein is stable, so you make more proteins and they just pile up, this is unrealistic, okay? Real mRNAs and real proteins undergo some rate of decay, some degradation rate. If they didn't, I think where we'd be, right? Um, so, you could produce, based on this, from two, temp two templates in the DNA, you could produce something like 10 to the seventh new gene products per hour, 10 million. That sounds like a lot. An urchin egg might be one nanoliter. One nanoliter. Um, typical cytoplasmic protein concentration might be something on the order of one micromolar. Now, of course, some proteins are very much more abundant. Tubulin, it's something like 10 micromolar. The other end, some sort of signaling enzyme like protein kinase C might be 0.1 micromolar. But somewhere in between, you have things like, let's say, the myosin heavy chain, present at something like a micromolar in a typical cell. With a nanoliter volume, one micromolar equals about 10 to the ninth, one billion molecules per nanoliter.
that's a big disparity between 10 million and a billion. And therefore you can conclude that if the zygote wanted to make from its two copies of the myosin heavy chain gene, all of the myosin that it needs to power the cytokinetic furrow that'll divide the zygote in two, it's gonna take days to achieve this kind of protein concentration, working flat out, again, with no transcript turnover, no protein turnover. There's no way the gene expression machinery in the zygote can possibly contribute to any change in the program. And that is probably why most zygotes are in such a hurry to divide themselves up into many, many cells. But if this is such a big problem, then why are so many zygotes so very large? Why not just make a smaller set of gametes and a smaller zygote? Um, let's consider that now. Let's start with a sea urchin and uh, we'll just divide that up at first cleavage, skip a couple steps here. It's gonna make it to the eight cell stage. Now, uh, as it happens in urchins, there's an unequal division from the eight to the 16 cell stage. The cells in one half of the embryo keep on dividing more or less equally. But the ones down here divide very unequally. Now, of course, you can't see it the way I've drawn it. This is the eight cell stage. This is about to be the 16 cell stage. And these small descendants of the cells in the vegetal hemisphere, that is the southern hemisphere of the embryo, are called the micromeres. There's something like a 30th the volume of their, sitter, of their sisters. So it's a very unequal cell division indeed. They go on to form a blastula. Pardon me if I don't draw the individual cells in there. Um, there's some cilia. Etc. In order to do anything interesting, blastulas have to fold up somehow, make organs, make internal plumbing. There are a number of things that happen during what we call gastrulation, that is the formation of the gut in an echinoderm embryo that include the invagination of a tube, which will become the gut, In sea urchins, a bunch of cells before this tube starts, a bunch of cells invade the blastocele and they set out to do something interesting. And as this tube is extending, a bunch more cells leave the epithelium and become mesenchymal. These both represent epithelial to mesenchymal transitions. These cells here will also do something interesting, make the first internal organs in effect. Eventually this tube has to connect to the blastula, blastula wall somewhere to open a mouth. This first opening in sea urchins, starfish become, sea urchins and starfish becomes the anus. Um, so once that's complete, the formation of the mouth, excuse me, Once that's complete, the formation of the mouth sort of takes place on one side uh, as the primordial gut, known as the archenteron, keels over. And in a sea urchin, the growth of a skeleton simultaneously deforms the shape of the embryo into a 
kind of an elongated prism like this. This epithelium is still continuous. I'm just drawing a cross section. Invagination of the primordial gut has punched a hole through it. It's now topologically a toroid, as we all are, right? If we look now at a focal plane up above, we would see within this prism shaped thing that some group of cells cluster around a forming mineral skeleton. These cells here, the so-called primary mesenchyme, these here are the secondary mesenchyme. The primary mesenchyme form the spicules of the urchin's larval skeleton. These are calcite rods that, as they grow, stretch the body out into a highly elongated shape, stretching that skin. If I continue with this same cross section, the eventual shape of a sea urchin larva seen kind of from the side is going to be something like this. It's going to have these long arms. Many of you, I think, have seen these before. Whoops, got to leave a hole for the ants. This is the so-called pluteus larva, again, seen from the side. We're used to looking at it from a somewhat different perspective, uh, which I'll draw in a minute. The blastula epidermis first folded up onto itself to drive a tube through the whole thing, and then got stretched by the growth of the skeleton, driven by mesenchyme cells that are still working on it. Stretching it out into long arms, surrounding a mouth and anus. This thing can feed itself now, now that its mouth is open. So I'm going to erase the beginning here in order to flip this larva up so that we look at it from this end. That's the way that most people are used to seeing it, either on a microscope slide if you're taking the lab, I hope you've seen one by now, or uh, in a textbook. So flip it up, look at it this way from what's effectively at the ventral side. So in yellow, here's the larval skeleton. The mouth is here. The anus is here. There's a stomach inside there somewhere. That's what this uh, big lump with a, of, of the original uh, Archeneron will become. The epidermis covers it everywhere, but in some places is uh, thicker than others along the margins of these arms in particular, coming around this way, down the other arm. Imagine turning the corner there and going up these arms over the hood that supports the mouth. This pluteus larva is a swimming particle collector and very roughly, it collects particles like so. There's a current, a feeding, a swimming current that goes everywhere away from the mouth. It goes away from the mouth here, 
etc. across here. That current is driven by cilia, which are especially dense in this green band. Now, they only have one cilium per cell, so you can imagine what the answer is. The cells here are shaped kind of like this. They're, you know, flat little fried egg things with a cilium, whereas the cells um, up in this green part, the so-called ciliated band, are long carrot-shaped things with a cilium sticking out so that they can pack many cilia together. Those drive the swimming current, which goes everywhere away from the mouth. But when those cilia encounter a particle that looks like it might be good to eat, they transiently reverse the flow and like a pinball machine, they send it perhaps along several successive bounces, several encounters with the cilia band, they send it back toward the mouth to be, to be swallowed. So these swimming particle collectors are out there. What does this have to do with the development of the adult urchin? Well, there's almost nothing in here that contributes to the adult sea urchin. This larval body is uh, almost entirely different from the body of the juvenile that will eventually develop from it. Its job is to collect enough stuff that sooner or later, a little pouch of tissue can grow kind of on the left armpit of this thing, can grow bigger and bigger until it develops a little juvenile urchin as almost a tumor inside this larval body. Now this is specific to sea urchins, but it characterizes very many animal life cycles in one way or another, because virtually all animals make a living by eating other living things. And you can go on find find exceptions. I'm sure they're out there. Uh, and the egg has to have enough provisions to get all the way through to here, all the way through development, to make enough cells that this thing has a chance of making a living. It has to build organs, digestive system, uh, the epidermis. In this case, it has to build the ciliated band so it can feed itself. So for a sea urchin that consists of uniciliated cells, it may not just be about getting big enough, it may also be about getting to enough, a large enough cell number that it can make enough cilia to drive water flows and operate this uh, pinball machine by which it collects usually unialgal prey. So now what about these micromeres? These micromeres, as it happens, if we just take out uh, I'm just going to take out in isolation the quadrant here. We've got a macromere, a micromere, and two mesomeres. We'll mostly ignore these. And uh, this micromere As it happens, they go on to divide um, asymmetrically the next time to make what's unfortunately referred to as large micromeres and small micromeres. Uh, the large micromeres, I'm coloring them yellow because they are what go on to build the skeleton of the larva. The small micromeres have another fate. It is these large micromeres that give rise to the primary mesenchyme. They're down here somewhere in the blastula. And they are the first ones to undergo this epithelial mesenchymal transition, go inside and wander around instead of participating in the epithelium. They also, as it turns out, the micromeres have an important role in inducing surrounding tissue to start this process of forming the gut. They act as organizers for development. In fact, if you take micromeres from one sea urchin embryo and transplant them to the top of a recipient embryo, 
they will induce the formation of a second gut from the surrounding tissue again, so that you'll end up with a, a Siamese twin em embryo as, at gastrulation. So again, the micromeres, they both organize early development, and they also form this skeleton that stretches the skin out into an efficient particle collecting device. Um, Starfish and sea cucumber embryos have a very similar kind of development in very many ways, but they don't have micromeres and they don't have a larval skeleton stretching the epidermis out. Perhaps because of that difference, uh, the larvae of sea stars and sea cucumbers, um, after all, they have to stretch their bodies out into a particle collector too that operates on very similar principles, perhaps they need more cells to make a bigger balloon to get that ciliary band stretched out and give it the reach needed to collect food effectively. Consequently, perhaps, in comparison with sea urchins, the eggs of starfish and sea cucumbers tend to be two to fourfold bigger in volume, that is. Perhaps these micromeres let the sea urchins get away with a smaller egg, but maybe there's even more to it than that. These cells are making an abrupt jump to the small cell size that's typical of the blastula. At small cell size, all those numbers get much more favorable for new gene expression. And that perhaps is why these behave as the organizers for, for development in these organisms. Perhaps by making this unequal cell division early on, these cells become able to change the gene expression program before all their cousins. It so happens the micromeres, like all proper organizers, are not really required for any of this. You can take them off of the embryo and you will eventually get a pluteus out, although its proportions will be slightly different and there'll be a few other differences. They aren't actually required to make the skeleton. Some other cells will take their job. They aren't actually required to induce gastrulation. The cells of the blastula will sort of, sort of figure it out for themselves. Uh, but by getting small early on, they are probably speeding up the acquisition of traits that make the larva an effective particle collector. And in fact, when you look at animal embryos, if you see small cells formed early on, it's a good bet that it's the small cells that are up to something. Now there's a few loose ends that I want to wrap up before moving on to the next series of lectures. Uh, the first has to do with oocytes. There are these remarkable cells whose great size is mandated by the demands of animal life cycles, got to make enough cells to make something that can feed itself. That size has costs, imposes constraints, and even opens a number of vulnerabilities. So let's start with the size, three months to make a starfish egg. That's a long time. Isn't there a shortcut? What about animals that have shorter generation times? I mean, you probably all know a fruit fly can complete its entire life cycle in two weeks. So what do they do? Do they just make tiny eggs? No, the oocyte has help. So here's the case for Drosophila in case you haven't heard of this before in a previous course, the oocyte in fruit flies begins as one of a group of many germline derived cells linked by incomplete divisions. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna bother drawing all of these so-called ring canals in color. There's a group of, depending on the insect, eight or 16 or 32 cells in this uh, assemblage of which only one is going to go on to be the oocyte. And these are of course surrounded by a somatic follicle, which has its own roles. Uh, perhaps in making the eggshell, defining polarity, things like that. These are called 
nurse cells they're close cousins of the oocyte they actually in flies in particular undergo extensive endoreplication that is the dna replicates many times without mitosis so they have many many copies 32 or 64 copies of the genome in there and thus many more copies of each gene to support biosynthesis they make a lot of stuff and while the follicle cells mediate the import of yolk proteins and so on into the oocyte uh, this egg chamber grows the oocyte becomes the largest thing in it perhaps uh, at an intermediate stage here the nurse cells as the follicles are helping mediate uh, oocyte nutrition and yolk uptake, the nurse cells transcribe genes, ribosomes, whatever, and they uh, are filling up the oocyte through these ring canals that also connect the um, members of the nurse cell continuum. And they ultimately dump their context, contents, shrivel up and die, dumping their contents through the ring canals into the full-grown future egg, still uh, in its follicle, which ultimately, too, is shed when the egg is fertilized and laid. So as they dump their contents in there, they have greatly accelerated the process of provisioning this giant cell for its subsequent very rapid divisions and uh, the development of all the organs that make a maggot that can go chew up apples and stuff like that, whatever fruit, whatever the insect does to make a living. This is not unique to insects. Amongst the animals that I know do something like this are tenophores. They have nurse cells that supply um, the oocyte in a very similar way. Nematodes have a similar trick. The gonad is, the, the ovary is syncytial. Many nuclei populate it and their products are pumped into developing oocytes. Uh, larvations do a similar thing to um, make their oocytes. Basically, anything that has a short generation time is probably doing something like this to shortcut oogenesis. There's another possibility I want to mention. What if you just amplify the oocyte genome, or at least the parts that you need a great deal of? And that's a strategy that is taken by uh, some animals. For example, frogs greatly amplify as much as a thousandfold the, the ribosomal genes into uh, a great big factory that produces many of the stockpiles of the translational machinery required for early development. That is the biggest demand for early development, making the biosynthetic machinery. Next, there's the next loose end. There's the extreme asymmetry of oocyte meiosis. Why not just make four eggs per oocyte? Well, the obvious answer is that would greatly set back the whole plan of stockpiling this big cell as big as it can be realistically and the time allowed. Does it break a rule about cytokinesis? I said the furrow as the cell divides always crosses the spindle midplane. Let me blow this up a bit in a couple of different cases and uh, think about what's going on here. So I'm just going to, for simplicity, draw um, half the circumference here. And uh, we'll draw half a spindle in here, half an aster. some kind of cleavage stimulus based on act two emanates from the spindle mid zone 
up to the cell surface to induce the formation of the cytokinetic fur. And you can roughly think of it as a kind of a broadcast with a, a, an angle. Essentially, what the astromicrotubule arrays do is maintain a coherent focus of whatever it is that's emanating from the spindle midzone, confining it to this equatorial zone here. And let's say there, this results in a distribution of signal intensity, something like that. The spindle were eccentrically positioned. We expect a similar skewed distribution Excuse me, let me draw that more accurately. It's supposed to be closer over here, and therefore the skew is supposed to be, uh, my hand um, accidentally made the skewing the opposite direction the first time around. Polar body cytokinesis is the extreme case here's this angular wedge again I haven't even drawn in the ratio quite yet but this extreme skew if now we um, change our view to something more appropriate to the process of polar body formation. Our imaginary distribution of the cytokinetic signal is such that it's going to dilute out very much to the periphery and be most concentrated right here. Now, furthermore, as polar body cytokinesis takes place, this actually becomes a little bud that the spindle protrudes into, and ultimately that little bud is pinched off like this. So no, it doesn't really violate a rule. It actually follows the rule. It's, uh, classic uh, example of an exception proving the rule almost. Now the final point I want to mention, final loose end, has to do with the um, asymmetry in the fates of the products of oocyte meiosis. Let's remember that this spindle is segregating chromosomes. Some of those copies in there have no future. They're going to end up in the polar body. What if a selfish gene on one of these chromosomes, or perhaps even a whole selfish chromosome, figured out a means to tell which way it was going to go and figured out how to bias its hookup so that it could preferentially attach to the spindle pole that was going to stay in the egg. That gene would sweep, that selfish gene would sweep through the population because it would always end up in the egg and never in the polar body. Such so-called meiotic drive factors are actually known to exist. They represent big deviations from the kind of treaty system that makes all of this stuff work. And it might be the real reason that meiosis involves crossing over, not just because it's a convenient way to make uh, paired homologs hook up together on the meiosis one spindle, but perhaps because by scrambling things, it, uh, by scrambling the parental genomes, no gene except maybe the centromere itself 
can easily tell which way it's going to be, uh, which fate it's going to adopt when it lines up for segregation on the female meiotic spindle. Wow. The papers that we'll read for the second set, for our second discussion, all concern special conditions imposed by the large size of the oocyte or the egg. One of them is going to have to do with the bookkeeping in starfish that disposes of the maternal centrosomes. Another one has to do with the process by which the meiotic spindle assembles in a starfish oocyte from such a very large nucleus, so large, bigger even than an urchin egg itself, actually, that it turns out to require a special mechanism that is itself illuminating. And the third one is going to concern the checkpoint signaling or the lack thereof that afflicts embryos derived from these very, very large cells. And the fact that one little kinetochore has very little chance of emitting a signal so strong that it can hold up the entire cell cycle in this great big egg.